Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for, for being here. We're going to open the silent room. Centuries ago, the origin of the word library was the inner bark of trees. This silent room, which I've designed with Atelier Oslo and Lund Hagen over there, is our forest come to life. It's been handcrafted from Future Library's trees, cut into around 16,000 pieces. Uh, organic curved shapes like tree rings wind around the space and invite us in. The core of the tree contains 100 drawers embedded in the wood and they'll each be filled by, with author's manuscripts which will slumber over the coming century. The room provides a quiet reflection space. It's slow, allowing visitors to feel time to be silent and still. It's been designed with simplicity, purity and restraint in mind. Within this quietude, visitors can consider what's hidden inside the texts, the deep time lying ahead, the unborn authors, the sealed words, and the generations of people to come that the project speaks to. My deep gratitude to the library, the architects, and all the amazing carpenters that have brought it to life. So we invite you to take off your shoes and step inside, one by one. <laughs> Uh, I have got the honour of placing the first manuscript, uh, Margaret Atwood's. Yeah? Thank you. Before we open, just a second, because I have some thank you to do. This uh, project has been handled by Björvika Utvikling until now. And uh, my colleagues in Björvika, of course, I have to thank you. And especially Truls, uh, who has Clemens, who have had a lot of headache lately finalizing this, but this uh, room is designed by the artist Katie Patterson and the architects Atle Oslo Ulund Hagen, but I want to mention Nils Ole Brandseg, Bosengan and Svein Lund in particular. The wood construction and carpenter is the company Timber, and uh, at the beginning Anders Frøstrup was the main carpenter and the brain behind he unfortunately died during this process, but Jonas Lövset, who is here, he really needs an applause. <laughs> and then we, some, the timber from the forest we cut has been at Svenneby Saga Høvleri. And uh, Ole Svenneby is to be thanked for how he has uh, handled the timber. The light is uh, concept design IS Fredrik Eng, who is here. The manuscript boxes is designed by Boswick AS and Rune Ramsher and Frode Bjørnvetter Lars Gunnar Ottelei. Tack till dere. And uh, the glass, handmade glass, handcast glass, you will see. 
uh, is made by Magnus Glassverk and our prominent uh, glass consultant, Ulla Brandenberg. So thank you very much, and please, Mayor Marianne Borgen, it's time. I am really proud and honored that we have this wonderful project here in the heart of Oslo. So I hereby declare the future library silent room for officially open, but I have to use the scissor first. And now we will put all the manuscripts in. I'm uh, going in there to make sure everything works. <laughs> Goodbye.
Hello, everybody. Today, we have met under open sky, surrounded by old forest, sitting among young trees that will grow large and strong for the next 92 years, and shared hope for our common future. I was introduced to the work of Katie Patterson when I entered the position as the director of the main library here in Oslo. My name is Merete Lee, and I am deeply grateful to welcome you all to Dijkman Björvika and the conversation that are about to take place. When this library opened two years ago, we continued to carry on the proud tradition of delivering library services as we have done since we opened first in 1785 during the Age of Enlightenment. As cities throughout the world build new, wonderful libraries, our main vision remains the same. To share stories and knowledge and to encourage conversations in contemporary modern libraries based on trust, there is a future. We fill our libraries with books, newspapers, films, music and art. These collections represent the essence of what we talk about, what we engage in, what we laugh of and what we cry about. Every week we welcome 50,000 visitors in this main library, all ages, all wallets, all languages, all colors. Come visit by yourself, bring a friend or bring a family. You don't have to answer to anyone why you are here and everything you do at the library is free of charge. And it's wonderful to finally be able to open the silent room for all these people. Future Library share the idea of handing knowledge down through generations. The Future Library connects us to the future, and in the future it will connect us to the past. A small clearing, a forest growing, 100 authors, an artwork stretching into a future we know little or nothing about. As Katie has said herself, it's a living, breathing, organic artwork unfolding over 100 years. Margaret Atwood from Canada, David Mitchell from England, Sean from Iceland, Elif Shafak from Turkey, Han Kang from South Korea, Carlo Wegnauskor from Norway, Ocean Wang from America, and Sitsi Dangaremga from Zimbabwe are writers in the project so far. And Katie, I don't know how it is to write for an audience you will never meet, but I must mention, for a reader like myself, being here present and dead in the future, witnessing powerful writers I love to read, putting their manuscript to rest in a box until long after I'm gone, that's kind of unsatisfying and hard, just so you know. <laughs> and welcome to the two writers who are here today and represent the year 2019 and 2021, Carlo Wiknauskod and Sitsi Dangaremba. Ocean Wong should have been here, but are sadly prevented because of Corona. Carlo Wiknauskod made his debut as a writer in 1998 with the novel Out of This World. He's well known for his multi-volume autobiographical novel, My Struggle, uh, which has been published in more than 30 languages. Since the completion of, the, of My Struggle in 2011, more than 10 years ago, he has published uh, a lot of novels, among them The Morning Star and the book that is still uh, with a Norwegian title, Ulvene fra evighetens skog. The New Yorker book critic James Wood has said about Knaus Knausgård and my struggle. Intense and vital, so powerful, alive to death, 
where many contemporary writers would reflect, reflexively turn to irony. Knausgård is intense and utterly honest, unafraid to avoid universal anxieties. Titsi Dangaremga from Zimbabwe is the eighth author to the Future Library. She, she is both a filmmaker, an activist, and a writer. As a writer, she gained international recognition with her trilogy of novels, Nervous Conditions, the books of Not and This More Normal Body, which were written over three decades and follow a young woman's struggle for independence. Nervous Conditions from 1988 became the first published English novel by a black woman from Zimbabwe. The BBC named it one of the top 100 books that have shaped the world. Her books are praised as magnificent and sublime by the critics. And to moderate the conversation between the writers, we are lucky to have Anna Hilde Nese with us. She's the director of Kunstnernes Hus here in Oslo and has helped us out here since Corona as well, took the original moderator from The Guardian uh, away from this event today. So I wish all the three of you welcome onto the stage. I think you have to walk around and up so you don't um, stumble. Give them a warm applause. a good turnout. <laughs> How many people have been in the woods this morning? Very good. Quite a few. I'm glad to see it, quite a big percentage. We witnessed this morning uh, a beautiful ritual, uh, which I've witnessed before a few times, and it's been on pause a few times uh, for, for a few years. Um, a ritual where you hand a manuscript over to the city of Oslo and we hear the forester speak about the health of the saplings. We, ch we check the health and the growth of these thousand trees which Katie um, has planted. Um, and it's a project which speaks so much of hope and allows us to think in long lines. And Katie herself described it this morning as a century long player. I wanted to ask you, first of all, what, what was your experience in the woods today? And I'm going to ask you, Titi, first. Yes, well, thank you. Hello, everybody. Hello, again. Yes. 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 Sorry. It's, I think it's on. It's on. OK, yes. so I just have to hold it up. Um, yeah, so my experience in the woods today, well, it was a special experience. It was very moving. And there were different things that were moving about it. Um, one of the first things that moved me was hearing that the, the trees have established a strong root system. You know, uh, when one looks at a tree, one doesn't think about the roots. You think about the trunk and the branches and the leaves and maybe the way the wind is rustling in there and the way the birds are nesting and twittering in the trees. But that depends on it having a good root system so that it can get nourishment for itself. And that really made me think about this whole project about whether we, as human inhabitants of this planet, are paying attention to our root system and even what might that root system be for us as human beings. So that was the first thing that really struck me. Um, then I heard about Ocean Wong's statement where he said that this was something he had been looking forward to for so long 
And I thought about missing things. I thought about missing significant things which would have had a great impact on one's personal and spiritual growth and how one can make that good. I know that there's going to be another hand over the ceremony for him, but it won't be the same, and specifically not the same as this one, where the room was opened and all the other manuscripts are put in. And so again, I started thinking in the context of the human race and the opportunities for growth that we have missed and how projects like this are an occasion for us to start about making things good. So I could go on and on, <laughs> but I won't. So maybe you can imagine why um, I seem a bit spaced out. It's just that it's just really quite surreal. <laughs> well, it was, a, it was a very special day also ended with a minute silence. Uh, so yeah, it was a very uh, special moment. So root systems, Karlova, what did you, um, what did you think of the walk in the woods today and the ceremony? I didn't really know what to expect when I, when I started to walk. Mm. But what I experienced uh, was that this project for me has been very abstract and it has been been thinking about it, but in abstract terms. It's about the future, it's about what it is to write, it's, uh, it's about all kind of things that's kind of floating in this area where this art project is. Mm. But the great thing with today was that everything become concrete, everything was present, we were there, and that sense of presence, of being, uh, I really, really felt and really thought, well, yeah, this is what it is about, you know? It was almost like kind of community that is related to literature and to us and to, you know, just be. Mm. And I think every music that was there and everything that happened there, to me, related about being there. Mm. About being in presence. I was wondering if, uh, I mean, your, your books are now, you've, you've, you've um, laid them down into the uh, vault or the quiet room, still the room, uh, the future library, Fremtids Bibliothek, it's going to be there now until uh, we're no longer around. Um, uh, what does that mean uh, in terms of, I'm assuming usually when you write a book, you are around to perhaps promote it, talk about it. You can speak about the events in the book and the characters in the book and so on. But now no one's going to know. What does that feel like, Titi? Um, I really don't think about that aspect of it, Anhilda. I, I think about the writing. Am I writing something that speaks to me? Mm -hmm. I am always my first audience. And I think I've had to develop that as a kind of a defense mechanism mm. because I write about the things that are important to me and the things that are important to me are things that take place in my environment, my society, my community, which is in Zimbabwe. And um, these are things that are not necessarily important to the great publishing capitals of the world where decisions about what to publish are made. And so if I try to start thinking about writing things that would satisfy people sitting in New York and in London where I hardly ever am, um, I don't think I would write very well. So it's very important for me that at least when people tell me, oh, Titi, this isn't really working for us, no, sorry, uh, we, we think so-and-so does a better job. You know, when people tell me that, I at least need to know when I put myself there. I didn't try to be somebody else to try to satisfy somebody else because it won't satisfy them anyway. So it's very important that at least one person 
is satisfied by my work, and since I'm the first one to engage with my work, that person has to be me. <laughs> Very good. So you didn't, uh, yeah. <laughs> Amen. We should all think like this. So you didn't take any special liberties with this project that you might not have done if you knew it was going to be in a, uh, you know, reviewed in the New York Times? <laughs> I will tell you what I did feel. I felt that I had to make this as authentic as possible. And for some reason, that idea prompted me to stop writing on my computer and go back to writing longhand. For some reason, it was just something that, that happened spontaneously when I had the idea that I have got to remain present. I think that was the idea that I had. I have to remain present for 100 years. If I write today, you know, people travel. When I ask about Zimbabwe, so many people put their hands up. So people have an idea. So now we're talking about 140, 100 years later, and I need to be present. So I was thinking, how can I enhance that presence on the page? And that's how I ended up finding that I'm writing longhand again, and actually enjoying it much more indeed feeling that what is going onto the paper has less mediation than when I write on the computer. So that's a big change, and I think I'm going to go back to longhand now. Wow. Interesting. <laughs> um, Kalova, what about you? Um, uh, I was trying to look at the length of the manuscripts because at one point there behind there they were laid in front of me and I was trying to who, who's written really few pages and who's got a really fat thing and uh, I think yours was pretty <laughs> was pretty big it wasn't longhand I'm assuming <laughs> no it wasn't no what is your uh, what is your reaction to um, did you take any special liberties in this uh, when when you're not uh, well when you're not going to witness the reception of your book uh, you're writing to a future reader um, did that uh, did that manifest itself at all when you as you were writing it I th I thought maybe it would before I started to write. But then it was exactly the same as it always is. And I felt very much the same way as, as you described her. Um, you know, this project is kind of huge. And the way we talk about it and the way it's presented and, and you know, and, and, but I can't say anything to the future. I can't tell anything to the future. I can't, I can't live up to this project. So I feel like I've been hired to, to write, and I've done that. And, 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 uh, and the only thing I could contribute with was you know, just sitting down writing. So it's, it's not on behalf of anyone else than, than myself. And that feels kind of terrible, just because we're sending something into the future, and it's, and it's you know, tiny and little. And, but, but it is basically has to do with you said about presence and, and the whole the whole thing of what, what it is to be actually so so I, I can't pretend I can't take on anything else than you know, just the little and small and insignificant things and your did this project I want to I wanted to also you say you're hired and you did your job um, but uh, what does it mean to you why why did you accept the invitation your your work is often about um, centers around big themes, time, literature, um, nature. You wrote about a mountain, uh, San Horna, uh, which is also about mountain time, I think, as, part, as, as opposed to human time. Uh, how, how, do you, how did you respond when you were uh, invited to this? Uh, I mean, obviously you said yes, we know that because we're here now, but yeah. uh, apart from that... <laughs> no, I heard about the project uh, when it started with Margaret Atwood, and, and I remember thinking, oh no, I hope they could ask me. <laughs> uh, there was no reason for me to hope that, but I did because I loved the project so much. I think it's so many things that is, you know, set in play here. That's, that's um, um, you know, it's, it's also kind of a childish 
fascination. It's the, it's the time capsule, you know, and it's the time that's changing and the culture is changing and, and yeah, somehow it's, it's just incredibly, I found it incredibly interesting. Well, like the forester was talking earlier about, um, you know, projects and politics and you usually have, you know, a four-year cycle perhaps or, a, you know, that's kind of how far you look into a project. I don't know when you write a book how long, how, how many years you kind of think it might take. But, um, you know, the forester will speak about, oh, in 100, you know, we're planning 100 years ahead and this kind of time... Uh, this kind of, of, of horizon is a rare thing in our, uh, in our world. Um, I'm wondering a little bit, keeping, keeping uh, in the, uh, on the subject of time, Titi, you, you also wrote in your introduction in the, um, in the uh, pamphlets that I really recommend everyone um, takes, uh, takes one. There's one for every author. You write uh, a little bit about uh, an African two-dimensionality of time, and you also mentioned this a little bit this morning um, at, at the handover. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, I, I have come to... Well, I've been looking for answers, let's put it this way, to some of the things that I see happening in Zimbabwe. And uh, so I've been reading what we can call African philosophy, although in terms of the way people on the continent themselves looked at that mode of thought, it wasn't like philosophy. Um, it was ways of being, it was ways of living well together. And if we go right back to the origins of philosophy, in fact, that was the objective of philosophy. How can we find common ways of thinking and being in society that maximize the common good? So I think that that is something that is common to all societies, that at some point people are engaged with maximizing the common good. And uh, the, the formal way of looking at that is what we can call philosophy. Um, so I wanted to go back and look into African ways of thinking about this problem. And that is when I came across a book that is called um, African Religions and Philosophy by John S. Mbiti, who is late. I think he died in 2019 or 18 um, from Kenya. And he did a lot of research into the religious beliefs and practice in at practices and ways of being of African, different people on the continent, mainly from uh, uh, Cameroon around that area down. So that is an area that has a kind of common cultural history. So a lot of the practices and beliefs are very similar. It's what people call Bantu today. And he was talking about um, a kind of way of looking at time that is bound by the seasons and productivity and having enough to eat. So when you look at time in that way, you do not project so far into the future. So what becomes important is building up a society, which actually means that as you get older, you need to be thinking about your legacy. So this is why people look at, at time as flowing kind of round in the present and then emptying out backwards. Um, and I found that this was quite compelling. It is not that people do not think about tomorrow and the next day, but it doesn't have to be thought about in a linear way. It can be thought about as a source for today. So this is why I thought this project actually ties in with that a little bit, because we are now making our ideas about time and our ideas about tomorrow a source for what we want to do now. We are saying we want to write and we want to preserve this writing so that people in the future can see what we are doing. And in doing that, we have to also interrogate what we are doing today. We start thinking about how our interventions are going to impact the future. And so when I brought that up, uh, there was a reaction which I can fully understand because, I mean, what, two dimensions of time, you know, we've got past, present, future, everybody knows that, but do we? 
um, can we really say that today the way we behave is a way of behaving that recognizes that third future dimension? And if we say that the way we behave today recognizes that third future dimension, then why are we behaving in the way we are? You see, so it becomes much more complicated than it looks at the beginning. And um, this project has been the occasion for me to deepen some of my thinking about this issue. That's fascinating about the backwards flow, in a way, of time. Do you have any comments about that, Karlova, the backwards flow? I don't, I'm trying to, to think... Um, I don't know, you moved to the UK five years ago. Um, the UK is also famous for, England is famous for thinking backwards of, of, um, of um, I don't know, honing its uh, historical legacies. And um, maybe rather than thinking into the deep future uh, and recent political events there maybe show that. I don't know, do you have any? Any comments to that? <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, I've, I've had this feeling for quite many years now, and it's very hard to, to talk about, really, because it's just a feeling. But that's uh, that the past is taking more and more place, more and more space, and there is, it's like the future has gone. It's like we expect future just to be more of the same. Mm. At the same time, times are changing more than ever, you know? So it's like that kind of change, that rapid change isn't integrated in a consciousness of the future. Uh, and there are books about this called ontology. It's about the past kind of being being almost taking more and more and more space. Mm, we're haunted. And then and then this this incredibly you know clear thought about the future comes into this into this project, which is mm. um, yeah it was just almost liberating because mm. it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thing you can choose, you know, mm. because mm. the future doesn't exist. I yeah. mean, it just doesn't exist. It's what we make it. And exactly that I think this project is doing. It's what I said in, in the speeches, it makes the, the future present, you know, mm. and, and that's kind of, I think it's incredibly important. Mm. But of course, it is also incredibly difficult to talk about. That's the genius of projects like this, because you don't have to think, you can feel it and you can get it and you kind of almost you pos are positioned somehow uh, if you give it a, a chance, which I think yeah. we should. Yeah. Absolutely. It's funny because I read recently, I think it was in The Guardian, that the UK was trying to go back to inches and, you know, to, to go away from the meat, you know, from... from um, and, and also Brexit, I guess, is another um, situation where you're, you're thinking backwards, perhaps, and, and looking, looking back to another, another time. I wanted to ask you, um, Titsi, about your, your daily life in San Pablo. Where do you write? What kind of room? What does it look like? We now know you're going to write for hand, by hand, in the future. Yes, well, um, I do have a room that I write in. And it's, uh, it used to be the children's den, more or less, where they could entertain their friends. So um, it's kind of bittersweet, because now the children are lo no longer there. They're all out of the house. <laughs> they are not entertaining their friends, so it means that I have a room to write in, which is a good thing. Um, it's quite big. It has a fireplace. My desk looks out over the yard, and we have lots of trees. I live in an area where a lot of nouveau riche people have moved in. And for some reason, moving in has entailed cutting down the trees. So my plot is one of a few that still has trees standing. So we have lots of birds. And that's really wonderful. I can sit and I can watch the birds and I can listen to them. But it is above the kitchen. So I hear everything that's going on in the kitchen. Um, but it's still a good place to write. 
So does that answer your question? That answers my question. It paints, it paints me a picture of the, of the currents, of the day-to-day -day goings on in, in Zimbabwe, in your, right. in, in your community. In my, in my little writing area. Yes. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Karlova? In the south of London, where do you, uh, ha uh, what's, what's your writing situation like? <laughs> well, I, I got a... Do you have a laptop in bed? Do you have an office? I have a, I have a, um, it's a kind of a extension with a glass, so it's um, sitting in a glass, uh, glass pur, glass which is called a conservatory. In a conservatory, yes. yeah, writing. Mm. That sounds that sounds rather leafy and lovely. <laughs> Did this? Did the project challenge your thinking about your relationship to your own legacy? You're for, you're, you're because it's going to be read in the future in a hundred years? Yeah. yeah, I was thinking that maybe the literary critics are even worse in a hundred years' time. You can never know. I'm not a literary critic, by no, the no, way. No, no, but it is, it is, you know, it, to write a book and publish it, it's risky. It's not really risky because you don't risk anything, but it's, 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 uh, it's not something you look forward to. You know, never know how it's going to be received, so I try to stay away from that. And, and basically in this situation, it's the same. I, I just try to write it and, and, and leave it behind. And it's no different for me, actually, that it's published or not published. Sounds very weird, but it's true. And I think it's terrible to think of that someone will read it now or in a hundred years. It's the same thing. It doesn't matter. It's all terrible, <laughs> basically. Yeah, yeah. It's a terrible I to think of somebody reading your work. No, you know? I, I find it liberating <laughs> because um, I'm so used to people saying, "Well, no, we're not really interested in that." Well, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That that didn't happen. Um, not even Anna Beata has seen it, so she can't even give me side eyes. Well, Sissy, what did you write? And um, if they decide in whenever the vault is open that this is not what they want to publish, you know, I might be present in a different form and get to hear about it or sense it but it, it, it won't be the way that it actually threatens my existence. <laughs> Very good. I also which, which is the case now. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. Yes. Uh, I also wanted to say we are going to open the conversation for questions. So if you want to uh, uh, ask, ask uh, Kalova or uh, Tsitsi anything, um, you can start thinking about it. Um, I also had a question which I, uh, I, I tipped you earlier about because uh, I was wondering if you had an author you might recommend, Katie. And now I'm thinking in order to make that an easier question or perhaps a more abstract one, you can choose either um, uh, current authors but also uh, all the dead ones. <laughs> Any author, anything that has inspired you that you think fits into this fantastic project about deep time and the future of humanity? Do you know, Anhild, I can't answer that question because I am fickle. I will read a book today and I will think, this is the best book I've ever read in my <laughs> life. Everybody has to read this. Yes, this is the person. And then tomorrow I'll pick up another one and it will be exactly the same. Okay. So it, that's really not a question that a person like me can answer. No. Okay, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. What about you, Carl Uwe? <laughs> Are you going to cop out on me? <laughs> <laughs> a recommendation to a book I never will be able to read. Yes. Yeah, if I'm kind to the future, I would suggest one writer I really you know, think would make this into an incredibly interesting approach would be for instance, Maggie Nelson, mm -hmm. which, uh, yeah, which I think would be great. Or maybe a poet, maybe Alice Oswald. Alice She's Oswald. also an incredibly wonderful writer. But then, if you make a list of good writers writing now, you could, I could at least, you know, say a hundred. Mm 
that would be on a Brilliant. top level. So the job is for them to do. Yes. Katie, are you listening? <laughs> well, Very good. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, and I was also wondering, do you have any questions for each other? <laughs> what did you write about? <laughs> Very good, I couldn't answer that. Um, that's rhetorical, right? Yeah. But Sorry, actually, it was a bad joke. <laughs> actually, we haven't, because uh, not everyone has been to the forest and not everyone's heard the title. So at least, perhaps, uh, you, you can reveal the title uh, once again, because that's allowed according to the uh, rules of the, of the project. So, Tsitsi. Okay, so my piece is called Narini and Her Donkey. Narini being one of the protagonist's name. So uh, Narini in Chimanyika that I speak means infinity, literally, uh, and in all time, so much as that. And um, I didn't think about that name specifically because of the project, but then I realized it was really very fitting for the project. Mm -hmm. Kaluba, your title. Yeah, in Norwegian it's Blindeboken. Mm -hmm. uh, and in English, it would be something like the blind book or the blind Blind, blind book. man's buff, isn't it? The the game, blinde book. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I think it might be called blind man's buff. Perhaps there are some translators in the in the room here that uh, that would uh, confirm. Um, uh, and um, yes, any. Does anybody want uh, to ask a question? But they can't ask a question about what the book is about. It's typed up, yeah. So you wrote it in longhand, and then you typed it, and then you delivered it. That's the process, yes. I see. Very good. Good question. Anybody else? There's somebody um, there. I don't know if there's like an ambulating. Um... Oh, here we go. Go, go, go. Thank you. Of course, we're extremely curious about the content of your projects, uh, your books, and of course, we will never know. But is it possible for you to say something about the process of writing them, uh, if you wrote them over a long time, or if you wrote them all like very quickly, or something like that, or is that uh, against the rules, Anna-Beata? Tsitsi, do you want to start? Did it take you a long time? Uh, I have a lot of projects going in at any, on at any one point because I am also a filmmaker, as I think you mentioned. So I'm also writing scripts and trying to get my productions on the road and trying to get directors. And then um, around the time that the email came to me, I was actually in Stellenbosch at the Stellenbosch Institute of Advanced Study on um, a fellowship there. And what had happened with that is that I received an invitation in my inbox to write an application. Now, I haven't do hadn't done anything academic for I don't know how long. So I put together this awful thing, which was so embarrassing. And it was about uh, the nature of the people in my part of the world. And I thought, you know, they're not going to choose it, but at least I've written something. And then, of course, they said, come. So I went, and that meant I had to produce something uh, on this terrible topic that I had just put together. So at the same time, I'm trying to do my writing for the Future Library, and I'm trying to do all this reading about a subject I knew nothing about. So, uh, plus my films, etc. So that's how it goes. And then, at the same time, my agent said to me, it was a, a very innocent question, so you see, do you write nonfiction? So I said yes, which was true, but I, wrote, I generally wrote nonfiction um, only to present as lectures and presentations. So then from there, um, 
I ended up being told that I was going to write a non-fiction book based on my lectures. So that was something else I was doing for the first time. And so I didn't actually have time to think about the project. It was more like, yes, I just have to write it because I've said I will, and um, it's good for me to have a fixed goal to write to while I'm doing these other things. So um, if I think about the actual time uh, as a block, it wouldn't be that long, but it turned out to be a long process because of all the other things. But I like it like that because for me, that's how my writing ripens and develops. Good. What about you, Kalova? The pro process um, of writing it? <clears throat> Did it take you a long time or not? <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah. It's, um... It uh, took a long time, but I didn't write it full time, so it was kind of a side project that mm. I, Dipped you know, when into. I had, yeah, yeah, bits and pieces here and there. You like to throat. work parallel projects? No, I never no. done that before. Okay. So I just, uh, just poured whatever was left into into that project, and it had mm. a kind of a, a separate life, mm. which, um, yeah. Do you reuse characters across books ever? Or, or do they appear in different characters that like old friends? Or are they always new ones? I, or, or across film? And, yeah. Um, I find that I write in a very different way to, to the... I write prose differently to the way I write screenplays. I was trained to write screenplays. Right. So I really do think about who's my character, how am I setting this up, what is this plot point, etc., etc. Um, but when I'm writing prose, because I never actually was taught how to do it, so I don't have to follow any rules. That's why I love it so much, yeah. you know. I just get in there and start scribbling. And then I think, oh, that didn't work, and cross it out. You know, I don't feel that I have to follow any rules. Mm -hmm. I'm actually thinking about going to, to, um, uh, to, to writing school now, because I think I'm strong enough in what I believe and what I want to do in my own voice that all those rules w will not um, uh, subvert me away from that. Mm. So for me, I have actually no process with writing apart from sitting down, listening to myself <laughs> and putting that on paper. Mm. Amazing. And you, do you uh, have characters popping up across your work? Uh, and into perhaps this one, although we're not really allowed to know that, but... Uh, no, not in this one, no. 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 <laughs> okay. I wanted to ask you, uh, maybe there is another question, but before I wanted to also ask you, you quoted this morning, Dream Kveta, as your favorite poem. Uh, do you want to say something about what that's about? Yeah, it's, it's one of, you know, I've always been fascinated. Uh, and I always wanted to do something about it and kind of to use it. It's just, it's just a story. It's, it's, uh, it's a man basically falling out of the world. He's falling asleep, and he sleeps on Christmas Eve, and then he sleeps uh, to the 13th day Christmas. I don't know what it's called, but... And, and, um, and then he goes to church and tells everything he has seen. So it's a visionary poem from medieval times. It's like... It's like... A, yeah, it's the same, same kind of, of um, poetry as, you know, very, very different, though, but, uh, you know, Dante is going to hell and... Yeah, so it's uh, in this context, it was just the feeling of being outside of time, outside of the world, and then coming back and telling, you know. And then in the forest today, I've, I was almost shocked how, how the feeling of how that worked with the past and, and the forest and us there and, and that music. And it was like, um, yeah, it was really... Uh, I really loved it, to be honest, to have it, to have it there. And I think all the different parts in the, in the day contribute to that very special feeling. It's so old, you know, but it still is with us now. And if you see the forest, it could be an oak, it could be a thousand year and then years, and then you have those little trees here as a few years old, and you got all at the same time, you know, and that's, that's also how literature works. You got thousand years, two thousand years, three thousand years, but books from yesterday, from ten years, and you can read them all 
Mm. And At the same all time, it's all, con- all contemporary, you know? Yeah. It's true. And they're all here in this library to read at our, at our leisure. Exactly. Nearly all, anyway. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? Yes. Um, two, two. Over here. Briefly, um, what is intriguing for me about this project is not very much the projection into the future, because this is somehow given for granted for any author, at least since 5th century Greece. I'm a professor of ancient history, so that's my perspective. (laughs) (laughs) But the exclusion of the present, and uh, this is something that makes me think, and it's... Maybe a bit weird, I don't know. I would like to ask your opinion about this aspect. How do you feel about excluding the, the people now, excluding the present, uh, and be projected in the future? Maybe you said something about uh, this. Yeah, and, and thank you very much for that question. And I think that possibly my view on this might be quite difficult quite different from other uh, peoples and indeed um, because I would say that I come from a difficult present and a difficult past which means that unless I have a great deal of imagination projects into a difficult future Uh, as to exclusion for me this is nothing new in fact I was surprised on social media when people started complaining and saying, well, we won't be able to read that book um, because we won't be here when it's published. And I thought, but exclusion is so normal to me. Um, So I think that people who have learned to live with exclusion have found ways of doing it. And for me, the way is about highlighting the present and what can I do in the present to try and change the future that is based on exclusion. And I think this is something I've been touching on in all my answers. But I can imagine that for people for whom the present is in fact present, uh, to be excluded (laughs) is a huge shock. And I think that that could actually be another positive thing about this, to make us think that not everything is for us to consume now. Some of the things need to be preserved for future generations to consume. So um, I wouldn't really see it as exclusion myself. I would really see it as good uh, stewardship, um, as almost... uh, a lesson, as it were, that look, you know, how many books are there out there? And these are going to be a hundred, over a hundred years. And we are already becoming concerned that these hundred books are not available to True. us to consume True. now. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think probably many of us, most of us might have more books. <laughs> Many of us might have the feeling that we have more books than we have years left to live in even our own private shelves, let alone obviously in a library. What about you, Kalova? Excluding the present. Yeah, if you, if you think about the specific books, then we are excluded from them. But that's not the artwork, you know? We're not excluded from the artwork. And the artwork is, is, you know, it's about the future. Where is the future? We can't see it, doesn't exist, but maybe it's here, but we just can't see it, you know. And this is a way of visualizing the future. It's here, it's in there. We can't, it's not for us, but we are part of it. What we are doing now will be part of the future. It's a way of visualizing all of that. So it's, it's not so much the book in itself, it's the, it's the whole concept, which is so brilliant, I think. <laughs> it's really, it's really, it's great. There was one more hand I thought I saw. Yes, there it is. I think that, yeah. Sorry. 
Ça nous va. Ok. Sissi, could you please um, share with us um, what you, in your projects, what you are currently working on in terms of finding the answers to some of the happenings that are going on in Zimbabwe that you're working on and finding the answers for? Thank you. Mm, good question. Um, yes, well, thank you for that question. My work takes um, several paths. I think that's the best way I could put it. But I think that everything that I do now is geared towards engaging Zimbabwean people um, to ask ourselves who we are and whether we want to be that kind of person and whether we want to be that kind of person or not, what kind of person do we need to be to ensure that we create a sustainable environment for ourselves to thrive. Um, so this is something I've been doing in my writing, um, which is why in the Tambutai trilogy, the protagonist evolved into this rather unpleasant character in the second and third. Um, I did start that book shortly after Zimbabwe's independence, that trilogy, with the first book, and things looked more hopeful. But as I saw things were changing, I wanted to write in a way that could point to some of these issues. Um, beyond that, I, ha I am doing quite a lot of research on who this group of people are, which you may know as the Shona people, which is a fiction just been talking to Panache about that. Um, uh, that. That is a fiction that was invented by Cecil Rhodes in order to justify um, occupying the territory, just grouping different peoples together and call, saying that they had the same language <laughs> and giving that language a name um, that nobody knows uh, what the origin is. So um, that's another thing, and I'm hoping to maybe write more nonfiction on that. Um, also, I feel that I need to engage with what some people call apathy, but which I think is in fact um, simply a result of what I call the interruption of the evolution of society in my part of the world because it was interrupted in a very brutal way by the British South Africa uh, charter company which came up with a private army to basically make the whole area private property which they succeeded in doing. And so that was a great interruption to how life had been lived. So we don't actually know how our institutions would have evolved over this time. And of course, the institutions that come out of being annexed as uh, private property. So basically what happened is that the British South Africa Charter Company um, set itself up as a kind of overlord. So people were then reduced to serfs. It was a kind of serfdom. And that has not really changed uh, with independence. Uh, and so people, I think, really do not know how they are supposed to act. If you are a serf, um, absolute obedience is going to be your best way forward. And so now you're told, on the other hand, that according to the Constitution, you have a democracy where you have to exhibit your agency as a citizen, but your government itself is treating you like a serf and meeting out the kinds of punishments that are meted out to disobedient serfs. For example, in the last week in Zimbabwe, we have had two members of the opposition being uh, murdered by uh, ZANU-PF agents, and we have another who has been um, severely assaulted. The person who was severely assaulted had, was abducted and tortured last year, was left for dead but survived, and went to the police to report his case. When he arrived at the police station, 
they charged him with faking his own abduction. So he had to go to court to defend himself and say, I am not lying that I was abducted. I was actually abducted. So he did that. And it so happened that he was acquitted. So people said, you are quite right. You are not lying about your abduction. You were, in fact, abducted. So he's now a free man. And uh, because the court acquitted him, he is now assaulted again by ZANU PF agents. Um, one of the people who was uh, beaten to death was simply a community organizer. And the, another person who was murdered, a woman this time, was abducted on the 24th of May in broad daylight. I think Zimbabweans have changed. We have had abductions before going back over a decade, 15 years. And when these abductions in broad daylight began to happen, people were so stunned and so shocked and so intimidated that they didn't know what to do. But now people are taking photographs, they're intervening, and they're identifying the people. So sometimes you have people who are even actually named, like in the case of this woman who was murdered, and uh, nobody was taken in for questioning. So the citizens launched several initiatives, a petition, people in England demonstrated outside the Zimbabwean embassy, and then around that time is when the police discovered the body that had been dumped in a well. But as far as I know, this happened yesterday, and the body was identified yesterday. So that's also why I'm a bit distraught. You know, these things are going on, and one always feels involved. Um, the body was identified yesterday, but as of my latest information, which was this morning, no arrests had been made. You know, so this is the kind of situation that we're living in. And I've, I ask myself, what kinds of interventions can I make as a writer to enable people to understand better um, that they do have some agency and that there are areas of competence that are availed to them by documents like the Constitution. So basically, that's how I engage. Practically, um, we find that the youth are completely disillusioned and hopeless. We have uh, something like 90% unemployment rate. Most of the graduates from the several universities end up on the street vending and hawking um, if they find anything to do at all. You find that professionals like doctors and nurses, um, teachers, are living below the poverty line. They, sim they simply cannot even afford to go to work, basically. So th this is the situation that people are living in. And so young people just say that they, are, they cannot even vote. And they say they don't want to, but it's obviously a psychological situation they are in of absolute despair. Um, they simply cannot find the energy. They cannot motivate themselves. So uh, I, I try to intervene uh, where I can with narrative um, and also with engaging people like on social media. But the specific project that I have now is it's actually a speculative fiction, a young adult. And I, I simply have young people who manage everything. You know, even if it comes to wrestling with the ancestors, they win. <laughs> so that's the, the, the project I'm working on now. I think we have time for one last question. Yes, you get to close it. Obviously, we're all uh, gathered here today because we want to see a better world. And I would like to ask both of you what effect you think this project can and maybe will have on the world and why you got involved in it. Shall I go? 
Yeah. yeah. After what you just said. Uh, for me, one reason, one very strong motivational drive for engaging in projects like this is that I am aware that it is a platform for me to talk to people that I might not otherwise be able to talk to about concerns that I have. And one of the concerns that I have is really perhaps the way uh, some parts of the world are perhaps so comfortable that they seal themselves off uh, and just enjoy their, their comfort. Even without going back to think about where that comfort came from, which is pertinent, but even without doing that, one can look at the example of Ukraine, the war in the Ukraine. So Europe and, and most of what we call the West is now focused on that war. And probably not thinking about very much else. Everything else in the, in the world is kind of blended out. But then from where I come from, I'm reading a book um, now uh, about uh, Tabon Beki, uh, biography, but not the authorized biography, but a biography. And there I am discovering the extent of the relationship between the ANC and the Soviet Union. So now, if that is going to be ignored, I think that is short-sightedness. Um, uh, my president in Zimbabwe, Mr. Manangagwa, came back uh, from the United Nations when they had that vote about the war in Ukraine, where Zimbabwe abstained, but was then asked about uh, what the opinion was concerning the war in the Ukraine and said, oh, it was a very robust response on the part of Russia. And I think that uh, these things are very important and nobody's paying attention to them. Um, we know that Southern Africa is just so full of resources, minerals, oil, you name it. And yet people's vision is stopping at the Mediterranean coast, as it were. And um, that is why I like to get involved in projects like this. If I feel that the writing opportunity offered is something that I can deliver, then it is always something very positive for me to engage on this kind of platform. Because then you ask that kind of question, and I get to answer. Do you want to answer his question as well? I don't think I have anything to add, really. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much for your time, and thank you to everybody who uh, turned up today. Uh, it's been wonderful. Uh, to speak to you both uh, and uh, yeah thank you so much and thank you so much for sharing your reflections uh, on this extraordinary project future library and uh, after hearing you Tsitsi, let's hope not only there will be a future but that it will be a better future uh, ahead of us. Um, we will continue tomorrow to talk about time and nature and future library. We have a future library symposium going on in the ground floor. You will meet several of the future library writers. Uh, you will meet artists. Uh, you will meet, of course, Katie. And there will be talks from 9.30 until 3 o'clock. And fortunately, for those of you who doesn't have tickets, we do have some left. So please uh, go to our uh, Facebook page, Dijkman Bjerdvika, and you can continue reflecting on nature, time, sustainability, and development and future. Thank you for coming.